Eu sou Moreno, do FRJ. É, eu vou falar bem informalmente, porque talvez esse seja o espírito mesmo dessa, dessa mesa. Eu já, ouvi, eu já tinha ouvido falar do David num blog que eu leio, que é o Boing Boing. E ele, tinha uma, ele foi coautor de um livro chamado Clue Train Manifesto, que era um dos primeiros livros falando teoricamente sobre a web, que naquela época estava começando a, a ultrapassar aquela fase da bolha. Mas, alguns anos depois, já como bibliotecário, um amigo meu, bibliotecário também, Fabiano Caruso, ele, ele, ele mandou um e-mail para gente falando que ele tinha visto no Amazon um livro que tinha uma dedicatória para os bibliotecários. E que o nome do livro em português era A Nova Desordem Digital, que é o Evidence Miscellaneous, que o autor do livro é o David. E esse livro passou pelas nossas mãos e é, a gente ficou... A gente foi sur muito surpreso, não só porque... O David, no livro, ele fala sobre é, Dewey, Ranganathan, FRBR, Aristóteles, Lineu, e parecia que ele, não sendo bibliotecário, sabia muito mais do que um bibliotecário médio brasileiro ou internacional. Mas não só por isso, mas porque o livro, ele para mim, particularmente, ele foi uma ruptura em tudo que a gente aprendia na escola de bíblia, porque era uma nova visão para o, essencial, o que, que é o essencialismo no sistema de classificação. O livro completamente mudava tudo quando você tem toda essa frente de documentos digitais. É, e a partir daí, claro, eu virei fã do, do David Weinberger. E quando foi proposto é, no SNBU, que a gente, no início da, da, da organização, que nomes fossem sugeridos, eu, eu até brinquei no e-mail que eu falei assim, olha, se for para sonhar, eu quero que o David Weinberger venha falar no evento. E... Eu fico feliz que tenha, o sonho tenha se concretizado, porque eu sou fã mesmo, eu acompanho o blog dele todos os dias. É, ele está com um livro novo, que já, já, já bastaria o, o, o livro Everything is Miscellaneous, a nova visão digital, já ser bastante provocativo positivamente para nós bibliotecários, mas se não bastasse ele estar tá com um livro novo que está tratando também da parte de explosão informacional, que é o que também a gente cansa de ouvir falar. É, então, ele, ele vai vir para falar de tudo isso, vamos deixar em aberto. E o mais interessante talvez seja que, acho que talvez essa seja a primeira mesa, o primeiro dia, que a gente não vai ter um bibliotecário, um bibliotecário de formação falando. Vão ser três pessoas de fora e eu acho importante a gente ter essa visão de fora, o pessoal de web, o que, que eles têm a dizer para a gente, até, até porque eles talvez sejam mais usuários do que a maioria é, de, de nós mesmos, bibliotecários. É, então, é, eu vou introduzir o David, é, a, o currículo dele é tão extenso que não dá nem para apresentar aqui. Ele, é, vocês podem, eu, depois eu passo a, as indicações dos sites dele, mas é uma pessoa tão famosa que basta vocês procurarem no Google. Mas ele é pesquisador, atualmente ele é pesquisador sênior da, da Harvard Berkman Center. É, ele é co-diretor da biblioteca de Nova, do Laboratório de Inovação da Faculdade de Direito de Harvard. Ele, ele, eu perguntei para ele, você continua dando aula? Ele falou assim, não, eu nunca dei, eu nunca dei aula. Ele, ele é um pesquisador, ele é um pesquisador adjunto da Universidade de Harvard, coordena essa, essa parte dos projetos de, do Laboratório de Inovação. É, já escreveu esses, esses principais livros de web, se vocês forem pegar a bibliografia de web, todos os, todas as bibliografias constam o nome dele, porque ele foi autor do, do Clue Train Manifesto, do, do Small Piece uh, Lose Johnny, que não tem esses livros, os dois primeiros acho que não tem tradução ao português. Depois ele escreveu sozinho o Everything's Miscellaneous, que em português saiu pela, pela Campus Elsevier, que é a nova ordem digital. E agora ele vai lançar o um livro novo, que é o Too Big To Know, que ainda não tem tradução para português. Eu também a gente conversou ontem, ele está com deadline para apresentar o, a versão final e deve sair em breve aí no início do ano que vem. Ele já escreveu para os principais veículos de informação especializada, New York, New York Times, Wired, Guardian, é, enfim, então é, é o tipo de autor que quando a gente lê a gente fica é, instigado e, e faz a gente refletir muito, então é, eu espero que ele produza isso e gere isso hoje aqui pra gente. Então, é, professor David, join me please. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for um For that introduction, um, most of us um, dream of coming to Rio, and the notion that your dream is to have me in Rio is just a little, a little worrying. <laughs> But thank you. <laughs> um, 
Unfortunately, I don't speak Portuguese. Uh, I will try to speak a little bit more. I, I usually speak at a very fast pace, a little bit like this. I will try to speak a little bit slower. And um, I apologize for, for that. Thank you so much for having me in this beautiful city, in this beautiful country. Um, a, a country that is leading the world and understanding that we need a new, a new bargain, a new deal for how we make works available and accessible. That making the works of our mind available widely is of at least as much value as making sure that the authors get paid for every time somebody turns a, turns a page. That old balance isn't working. We need a new balance. And Brazil has been very progressive in leading this fight. So thank you. So um, yes, I do want to talk about what I have been writing about for the past uh, two years, a book that I am almost done with. Um, and it's about knowledge. Um, it's called Too Big to Know, uh, because as you'll see, the idea behind it is that the world has always been too big to know. We've had strategies for dealing with that. The digitizing of information gives us new strategies. So um, I have a, an argument, a thesis, that I want to present this morning, which is uh, very simple. Um, part one, the first statement is that we are living through a fundamental change in the nature of knowledge caused by the rise of the internet. And uh, part two, the second statement is that knowledge is becoming a property not of people and of, not a property of minds and not a property of books and not a property of libraries, but a property of the network. And the third part is that we have, in fact, structured knowledge without thinking about it. The shape of knowledge, how we think about knowledge, has been determined by how we have stored and communicated knowledge. And so knowledge has looked like a library. But now knowledge is taking on the properties of the network, and it is beginning to look like a network. And so rather than thinking, when we think about knowledge, we think about books. As the future comes to us, as we build the future, we will be thinking about knowledge more as a network, and having, this, the, being, having the nature and characteristics and properties of a network. But first, everything I just said assumes a type of techno-determinism. That is, the belief that technology has certain effects. Technology does things to us. And there are many people, in fact, I think all of us would deny that that's the case. Because we know that if you invent a screwdriver, let's say, the screwdriver can be many, many things. The, screw the screwdriver does not tell us how it should be used. We could use it to drive in screws. We could use it to mix a delicious drink. We could use it to play games. We could even use it to connect two wires so that we complete a circuit and we light a light. And all of those things that are things that a screwdriver can do and a screwdriver can be. The screwdriver by itself is nothing. The internet by itself is nothing. There is no such thing as the internet, but let me be very careful. Um, what I actually mean is there is no such thing as the internet, un internet, only one internet. The internet is what we make of it. Nevertheless, what I want to talk about today are five lessons that I think everybody learns when they go on the internet, except in very special cases. Anybody who has been on the internet understands that the internet shows us abundance, you know, plenty. It is a place where there are hyperlinks. It is a place where you do not need permission for most of what you want to do. It is permission free. It's incredibly messy compared to, say, a library. And it is unresolved. That is, it's a place where people who argue about a fact, about anything, they, there is no agreement. In fact, there is nothing, there is nothing that everybody on the internet 
agrees about. There is nothing that everybody agrees about. And so we are shown on the internet just how unresolved, how debatable everything, even knowledge, is. So even though, yes, the internet is just technology and you can use it for this and you can use it for that, nevertheless, it, these five experiences, I think, are quite common to the internet. Um, and these five experiences, I think, have an effect on what we think knowledge is. Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Too fast? Anybody? Raise your hand. OK. Because I can't go much slower. <laughs> OK. Should I go faster? No. OK. <laughs> OK. So the first thing that everybody learns when they go on the internet is that it is so big. It is so big. It is abundant. And this is actually a very different environment for us because most of us grew up in the age of information, the information age. And in the, the information age, even though we, during the information age, we were all taught that there is so much information in fact, during the information age, there is very, very little information. In fact, the information age, back when computers looked like that, uh, was all about reducing the amount of information to databases. In fact, we invented the term information, the meaning of the term information, <laughs> in order to, be, to be able to talk about the stuff that gets put into a computer. And the stuff that gets put into a computer is a tiny, tiny slice of what we know about the world or what we know about a coworker. It's a tiny set of information. And what information went in was decided from the top. Somebody decided this is what we will keep track of. So tiny amount of information. We invented information to be that which computers can manage, can control. In the age of the web, in the age of the internet, this person now looks much more like this. This is how we know this person. And what's characteristic of Facebook and of the web in general is that it's full of links. And these links are like the database categories, except that they come bottom up, anybody can create one. And there are so, so many of them. And they point out all over the world in, in a mess, in an, in an explosion of links. And so now we know much more about the people that we care about. That's a little bit, that's just one small piece of the abundance. But the idea that you can have as many links as you want, as the world wants, is entirely new and the opposite of the age of information. So in 1970, Alvin Toffler, um, start, made popular the notion of information overload. Right? So this is during the age of information in a book called Future Shock, a very big bestseller, a very good book actually. Toffler takes the term information overload. He's using, it, that, that term comes from a prior term from, from 20 years earlier called sensory overload. And the idea behind sensory overload was your senses would could get so filled up, let's say you are at a rock concert and there's the noise and the music and the crowds and the smells and your senses are overloaded and if that happens too much, you can go crazy. That's what sensory, the idea of sensory overload was. And it was mainly used in the 1960s to scare hippies. Don't, you don't want to go to that concert, you'll have sensory overload and you'll just sort of become a, a psychotic, <laughs> crazed person. Well, Toffler asked, sensory overload is real. Suppose instead your mind got overloaded with, not with sensation, but with information. You could have information overload. And information overload would have the same effect. It could, it could make you a crazy person. You could literally, you could go insane from all of this information that's coming in. And that's what information overload was. So then if you look at, okay, I mean that, 
seems maybe something to worry about, maybe. How much information were they thinking about in 1970? That they were so worried that we were going to be driven crazy by information. Toffler's book came out in 1970. By 1974, there was some research being done, especially by marketers who wanted to know how much information do consumers need. And so they did a study, a famous study. And they took 192 housewives, and that's in quotation marks because in English, a housewife is a demeaning term. So 192 housewives, they gave them in a study 16 different brands of goods, a soup and, a, and a so forth. Each of those brands had 16 items on its label. And the items were just yes or no. So it was high calorie or low calorie, salt, no salt. They did their tests, the marketers did their tests and discovered that if you gave 192 housewives 16 cans with 16 labels with 16 different categories on it, they suffered information overload. They could no longer make rational decisions. That was information overload. 16 cans, 16 labels. And you look at any supermarket, you go on any website, and there is so much more information that to be worried about this, to say that this is what information overload, it's like a joke. It's hard to imagine that anybody thought that that was too much information. The marketers liked this, by the way, because it, it gave them an excuse to keep consumers uninformed not to tell them too much because the poor housewives couldn't handle that much information. So they kept us in, in the dark, unknowing. So it, it turns out that when you go from the test lab of 1974 to the real world where we have so much more information, we did not become insane. We didn't become crazy. In fact, the term information overload no longer really applies to individuals. It's not a psychological syndrome. It's become a way that we talk about our culture, not about individuals. We say there's too much information in our environment. But in fact, that has simply become a fact of our environment. We just assume there is too much information. And our question is not, how can I not be crazy? How can I stay out of the lunatic asylum? Our question is, how can I get more information? I'm not getting enough information. I'm not getting the right information. We want more and more and more. Information overload is simply a description of the world we live in these days. It is not a psychological symptom. So Clay Shirky, who uh, is just a wonderful writer and thinker and also a lovely, sweet person. Those things don't always go together, but it does in Clay. Uh, Clay said recently, a few months ago, that there is no such thing as information overload. There's only filter failure. That is, if you feel you're getting too much information, what's actually happening is that the filters you use to select information, they are not working. And that's absolutely right, I, I think. But I'd like to add one piece to that. Because the filters have changed in a fundamental way. On the internet, the filters have changed. In the physical world, when your library has to decide which books it's going to take, the books that it does not accept into the collection, the books that it does not accept, nobody sees. Your library simply doesn't have them. The books that are proposed to a publisher, and the publisher, who is a filter, um, says no, those books are not seen. The old filters would, sit, would physically separate the piles into what you see and then the stuff that you just never, ever see unless you really try hard. That's very different from how filtering on the internet works. Because the filter on the internet all that you're really doing is bringing some items closer. So when you, make, you put up a list on your site or your library site, the most important works in sociology, and it's a list of 20 books, links. 
those 20 links bring those 20 works closer to the user. The user only has to click once. But all those other books that you didn't include are still available. They're just harder to find. But they're still there. And that is a fundamental difference in how filters work. It is, of, co of course, the case as well that you can have multiple filters on the same page or across your library site. That we no longer have to make a yes or no decision forever. But I think the crucial point is that there's always been too much to know. That's always been a problem for humans. Our old technique was to hide everything that was not important enough. We would filter in, and hide what isn't there. We still filter. We have to, of course. But there's no hiding. All that material is now still available to us. And that's a fundamental change in our strategy about how we know our world. And we are just beginning to figure out how to deal with that. So it turns out that in this world of abundance, where we do our filtering, we filter out and we get all the good stuff. But all of the bad stuff is still available. All the garbage is also still available to us. And I think one of the more interesting facts is that we are very, very good at managing the bad, managing the trash. We get lots of spam, but we, our email still works. We're good at managing the trash. The real challenges to our culture comes from managing the good, not knowing what to do with such an abundance of good stuff. And I'll give you a quick example of this. Because it, it, it's the abundance of the good that challenges the institu our institutions. So many of our institutions, including libraries, are based upon the idea that there is a very limited amount of good stuff. And so it makes sense to have simply one large building or even 43 large buildings that we call libraries that will contain the good stuff. That makes sense if, if there isn't that much good stuff. But if there's an abundance of good stuff, then filtering it down becomes an issue. So it, it's a challenge to our institutions, the value of our institutions. These are the columnists for the New York Times, the, the most prestigious newspaper in the, in the United States. The New York Times decided two years ago that they would take these columnists, very popular and important, and would make people pay to read them. They're New York Times columnists, people, they're worth the money, people would pay. And some people did pay, most people did not. The New York Times did make money doing this. But they recently put them up for free again. Because even though these people are worth reading, if you have to pay for them, most people said, well, you know what? There's lots and lots of good people to read on the internet. I really like these columnists, but there's another thousand people who are posting on blogs and other sites that are also worth reading. So I'll read them instead. There's an abundance of good. And so to try to uh, make good material scarce simply reduces the authority, the presence of those ideas. And that's why the New York Times once again put these people onto the web for free. When, they had to, when people had to pay to read them, they stopped reading them, and the influence and, and importance and the authority of the New York Times went down. Because scarcity used to increase authority. Now, scarcity decreases your authority. Okay, the second thing that people learn on, on the net is it's a linked world. Everything is hyperlinked, of course. So our old strategy, strategy for knowing the world before the net was a good strategy. It was the only one we had. The world is way too big to know. So we would break off pieces of the world that are about the size of a human brain. That is, one human brain could know this piece very, very well. That's why this is a big brain picture. And those people were experts. They understood one, one small piece of their world very, very well. And so we would take these experts and we would let them write books or we would put them on TV and we would ask them questions 
And when we got the answer, we would stop because the expert is the authority. And our system of knowledge in a world that was too big to know was a system of stopping points. That's what made it work. You could ask your question of an expert, read the book, get your answer, and not have to ask your question anymore. What is the atomic weight of carbon? Ask an expert, get your answer, you're done. You do not have to set up a laboratory in your garage and repeat the experiment. So knowledge was a very efficient system of stopping points. This looked like it was a property of, of knowledge. This is, it looked like this was natural. This was the way knowledge is supposed to work. But it is not. It is natural for libraries, for books. It is natural when knowledge was printed on paper into books and then put into collections. Because paper and books are disconnective medium. And so you have to try to get into your book, into your single book, everything that the reader needs. Because it's too hard for the reader to go to the next book. You put in the footnote in your book, but you know that very, very few readers are ever going to track that footnote because it would mean starting over in that corner and going around and going around and getting to the next shelf and hoping that the book is there. Books are a disconnected medium. And so knowledge looked like it had to be something that came in complete chunks that started with the cover and ended with the back cover and in between was everything the reader needed. The idea of knowledge as a stopping point comes from the difficulty of paper. Paper stops you. Paper does not let you go on very easily. It makes it hard to go on to get the next book. It is a disconnected medium, and that's why knowledge has taken on this property of being a system of stopping points. This is just a, a, a quick sort of advertisement for um, a session this afternoon where um, I'll be talking about a, a piece of software called Library Cloud, which um, has something to do with this. So I hope that you may come to that as well. Okay, so now we are in the world of hyperlinks, of course. And I, th I find it useful to think about hyperlinks as being a new type of punctuation. The old type of punctuation tells you where to stop. A hyperlink, as a new type of punctuation, tells you how to continue, invites you to continue. All you have to do is the smallest possible movement. You cannot get a movement smaller than moving your finger that much, and you will be at a new site. This is the direct opposite of how books work. Links, of course, are highly connective. So authority used to be the place where you stopped, where your question got answered. In a hyperlinked world, the authority is simply the last place you choose to click. When you get the answer that satisfies you, you stop. That site is your authority. Not a separate system of experts and of printed books that have gone through the filters that are declared the stopping point. You can get no further. Authority now is simply where you choose to stop clicking. And this, I think, also has a deep effect on the nature of knowledge. I will give you an example. If you look up, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look up philosophy in an encyclopedia, if you look it up in Britannica, which is the great <laughs> English language encyclopedia, you will find um, 180,000 words on the topic of philosophy. This is, it starts here and it ends here, 180,000 words, it's three books worth. If you go to Wikipedia, the philosophy article the last time I looked was 9,000 words. So it seems that Britannica must have 20 times the amount of information on philosophy. But, of course, I have forgotten something. I've forgotten the links. In the Wikipedia article, there are hundreds of links. And so if you want to know how many words 
Wikipedia has about philosophy, you're going to have to follow those links, every one of them. But it's much more complicated than that, of course. Because if you look at the article, you now have to decide which of those links are links to articles about philosophy. And some will be obvious. So the link uh, to um, Hellenistic philosophy, yes, that will be a philosophy article that you'll count. And the link to uh, Thomas Aquinas, yes, in the West, we consider him to be a philosopher. And the link to reason, you'll want to count that article. And then the link to faith. Well, do you want to count faith in your collection of articles about philosophy? I don't, Western philosophers have argued about this for 2,000 years. So you'll have to, maybe yes, maybe no, you'll have to decide. And how about, whoops, darn, pressed one too many. Um, and likewise for many other topics uh, that are linked here. God, for many people, God would count, an article on God would have to be part of the scope of articles about philosophy. So it turns out that when you are printing, you have to decide for your readers. Philosophy begins here and ends there. In a hyperlinked world, the topic of philosophy is just a little node with links out, and which things count and which things don't is up to the reader to, for argument. It turns out that topics are not nearly as hard-edged, as discrete and separate as our paper media made them look. They are spread out, all, everything is, is connected, everything is, is linked. And so trying to become an expert in a particular topic it was much easier when there was a set of books that told us what that topic was. And we had the idea that a topic had a nice firm border around it you, that you could master. But if a topic is a set of links that jump from here to there and you have to decide, then being an expert is a very different thing. Thank you very much. I, I should not be put near <laughs> it was a very good idea. But now I have the opportunity to somehow manage to knock it over there, which will be much, much funnier. Okay, so the next thing that everybody on the web learns is that it's permission free. Very different, again, from a publishing paper-based world where everything you read has gone through extensive checking and filtering and has gotten permission to be published. And obviously there's tremendous value in this. The Library of Congress in the United States processes 7,000 books a day. That's what it takes to filter. 7,000, that's a lot, and it takes a big staff of very expert, wise people, but 7,000 books a day is nothing on the web. There are people who tweet, tweet 7,000 times a day, a single person. The number of, of blogs and new postings is just so much larger than any set of curators could ever manage that it, there is no possibility. It has to be a permission-free environment. And what, we, what would it take to scale up the Library of Congress to manage the internet, which it does not want to do, but you know, if we wanted it to? It turns out that overall, Systems of permission that control itself simply doesn't scale, at least not very easily. It takes a tremendous amount of effort and money and time to scale control, to control very large um, collections, and, uh, including of people. And so in a world that's too big to know, a world that is not confined to paper, a different strategy suggests itself, which is simply to include everything. When in doubt, include it. The old was, let's filter beforehand, because we just don't have much space, so we have to. When you have infinite space, you don't have to filter beforehand. You can include everything, and then give people the tools that they need in order to uh, um, filter on the way out. That is, you can postpone when the filtering happens, and allow people to filter on the way out rather than filter on the way in. This has some disadvantages, of course, which I'll talk about in a moment, but it has the advantage of there is no person in this room, in any room, 
who is able to decide what is going to be of interest to everybody else. We can make better or worse judgments, of course, but we can never know that something that we're keeping out of the collection because it seems trivial, insignificant, it's gossip, it's about a small town. We never know what history is going to do. If you filter out the gossip about, oh, young female singers um, and they're being drunk or whatever, because it's gossip. You're right to do that in one sense. On the other hand, there are academics who are studying how the media treat young women singers. And you've just excluded their sources of data. It is impossible for anybody to know what will be of interest. And so by allowing everything in and filtering on the way out, the people who have interests can decide what in this collection is of use to them. And so we get much, we, we get much smarter. We get much wiser if done well. But that means that we are in the position of somebody on a hot day who goes into a bar. So here's what this person does not do. This person does not go into a bar, have the beer, drink it, and say, you know, that was a very good beer, but it was not the perfect beer. It is not the single best beer I have ever had, and so bartender, barkeep, I do not want it. Take it back. I don't want that beer. And the person goes to the next bar and takes a sip of the next beer and says, oh, it's very good. I like it, but it's not perfect. It's not, and puts it down and walks out. Nobody does that. What we do is we take the beer, the first one we say, oh, that's really good. This is good enough beer. It's good enough, it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And in a world that is too big to know, that is our only possible strategy for knowing the world. If it's good enough information, if it's good enough knowledge, then it's good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. And good enough information is good enough and we can move on. The problem is, as you are all now thinking, is, well, good enough for what? Because it's one thing to be good enough for beer, it's another if it's good enough to do brain surgery. And those are very different things. Good enough for beer.